morning to each of you. It's good to be uh, be back and be able to share from God's Word again and to share from His heart through His Word. Uh, joining me today in this service is, is my, my wife, uh, Janine. Oh, she's, <laughs> she's, with the, she's with the camera, right? There. She's with the camera. And, uh, amen. And so, um, and, and also is uh, some of our good friends. Next to her is Tyron, Tyron Richards. And, And the Larks family as well, they're with us today, so, all the way from Fairfield. So glad to have you guys with us. Um, I, uh, if you, how many of you, this is your first time hearing me speak? Oh good, good, okay. Um, one of the things that, uh, if, if this is not your first time hearing me speak, you know that it's, it's a real uh, passion of mine to, uh, to really help all of us as believers walk fully with God as Father mm -hmm. and, uh, and with the Spirit as our comforter, helper, with Christ as our Lord, Savior, and brother. He's not just Lord, Savior, and King. He's our brother. <laughs> We're in a family relationship, and the more we understand that family relationship and that family dynamic, the more we're, we're, we're postured to live out of that and it saves us from the, the, the ditch of trying to live Christianity as a religion because Christianity is not a religion. Um, but if, if we're living that, then that's what we're presenting to the world. And when the world says, well, there's a bunch of religions and Christianity is no different, you say, well, yes, it is. Uh, and then what we're communicating to them is religious talk. And what we're showing them is religious rituals then they're like, no, it is. <laughs> it is the same as everyone else. And so it doesn't work to just repeat to people over and over, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. That statement, it doesn't work in changing people's minds. Because if people have a view of God as in control of everything, sovereign, big, creator, out there, transcendent, then as they are trying to have a relationship with that God, it's going to be religious because they haven't really shifted from God being God, creator of the universe, to God being a person and father. And so to just see him as God can position us to, to relate to him from a religious perspective instead of seeing him as father, we walk with him not out of relationship. And so, as Christians, as Christians, this could be a challenge for us because we, we have a tendency to want religious things. Like it makes us feel good if we can actually do something to gain something. If, if all I need to do is pray five times to get this breakthrough, then I'm happy to pray those five times to get the breakthrough. Like there's a formula to it. We like for things to be predictable. We like for things to be methodical. We like for things to be something that we can actually control and produce a certain result. Uh, and, and when we bring that same mentality into our relationship with God as Father, well, it doesn't work because He's constantly outside the box. He doesn't work by formally. He says, I want to lead you by my spirit. And so the answer that I gave you in this situation is not going to be the same answer I give you in this situation. Yeah. Although you would want it to be because if, if it worked that way, then you wouldn't have to pray about the second situation. You already know what to do by just repeating the first thing. But because every situation is so different, I'm going to give you guidance, different guidance for every situation. You have to depend on me. You have to hear me every single time, not just one time. So, for example, if, if we're just looking at the method, then we say, okay, God, we're in a situation, we need a breakthrough, and, and then we, we pray, and then there's a breakthrough. Then what do we do the next time? Okay, well, okay, what did I say the first time? <laughs> right? How many of you done that? Or, what worship song was I playing? I was playing this song the last time when God moved. Let me just play this song again so God can move again. That's our tendency for formula and method and predictability and control. What worked the first time wasn't the song, it was your heart. You were desperate, you cried out, 
You admitted your limitations. You depended on God fully for the answer, for the breakthrough. That's what worked. That's what released the power. Not the words that you said. Not the song that you played. But we're tempted to, to try to create some kind of method or formula. And next thing you know, we've created a religious, uh, a religious system. And the reason why this is so dangerous is because if we as Christians live Christianity as a religious system, then number one, we won't fully benefit from all that the Father has to give us for ourselves. And number two, we can communicate that fullness to the world. And show them that it's relationship, not religion. When that, that void happens, when we live that whole religious peace, uh, then we, we create for ourselves, even as believers, as sons and daughters of God, a state of what I will call homelessness. Homelessness. How many of you have seen the, um, I want to share this, this illustration and kind of give you a picture of, before we get into the homeless piece. It helps you just really sink in this idea of responding to God out of religion. How many of you have seen movies where there is the, it's depicting the life in ancient Greece or ancient Rome? And there are movies like, um, like Troy or the 300 or, you know, these movies about that particular era. And what you hear in some of the dialogue is how they respond to the gods. Right? Don't do this because you'll make the gods angry. And if the gods are angry, then we won't have a harvest and crops. If the gods are angry, then we're going to lose in battle when we go to war. On the other hand, we need to do certain things to appease the gods because if we make the gods happy, then we'll be in favor with the gods, and the gods will bless us. Right? So we want to avoid bad behavior because we don't want to get on the bad side of the gods. We want to do good behavior, one of these religious acts or works, because we want to appease the gods so that they'll have favor on us, and that's the same way some Christians try to respond to God. Christian mythology. And you see it in their lack of peace, their lack of joy, and you, you see it in their anxiety, in their relationship with God. Oh, I, well, I, I just did this. I know God's mad at me now. No, see, that's, that's, that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. God has much more uh, a healthier emotional health than responding to your craziness. Okay? When you act a fool, that does not disrupt the atmosphere of heaven. So when we sin, God does not go, oh my gosh, they've done it again. Jesus, spirit, angels, what are we going to do? I'm so sick and tired. I've told them over and over. God doesn't have a breakdown like that. He's, he's emotionally stable. That's why it's good to depend on him for your source. I was looking at a, uh, a, a video clip of uh, Lester Holt. I, I can't remember what news agent he works with. I should have looked it up between the last service and this service. ABC. <laughs> ABC, okay, ABC. thanks. NBC, okay, some of the letters. Um, <laughs> and he was, he was doing a segment on the state of homelessness in California and specifically in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and how that's just really gotten, gotten out of control. So he's interviewing some different people, and there's a statistic that came on the screen that said California has 47% of the nation's homeless. When people are physically homeless, we, we, um, we describe that by saying they, they're without shelter. They're, they're without physical shelter, physical housing. But if you talk to someone who is homeless or on the street, you'll see that there's, there's much more as, as, as a problem that they're experiencing than just not having a house. 
Sometimes that contributed to them not having a house. Sometimes it was because of them not having a house. And the issue of homelessness is hard to, to, to find a solution for cities, counties, states, all across, not just our country, but across the world, deal with homelessness in a variety of ways. Um, and, and they try to address it. Because uh, if you have 10 homeless people, there's 10 different reasons why they're homeless. Mm -hmm. Some situations are acute homelessness, a short term. Some, something happened financially and they just lost everything right in the moment and next thing you know they had no place to go. Uh, other times there is, um, there is a chronic homeless, long term. People don't want to be in a shelter. They, they want to be on the street. They want to live and that's the, ch the life that they've chosen to live for 15, 20 years. And then there's all kind of reasons all in between. Okay, this is not about finger pointing. This is about saying that there are multiple reasons why people get into that situation. And there are multiple symptoms, evidences of a homeless, not just lifestyle, but a homeless mentality. I submit to you that homelessness is not just about the, the lack of a shelter and a physical housing refuge, but homelessness is also the lack of relationships. Remember there's a song um, that said, this house just ain't a home since you've been gone. Because home is not about the building, home is about the relationships. With the relationship being, uh, being fractured, it doesn't feel like home. Growing up in the military, we traveled around a lot, and, uh, and one of the things that I, I would tell people when I left home and began, began to be an adult on my own, is people say, well, where, where's home for you? If you travel around a lot, where's home for you? And I say, home is wherever my parents are. Home is not about a physical address. That, that, that's the address of a house. But home is about where the people are that I am in relationship with, where out of these relationships, I have a sense of value and respect and honor and security and comfort and worthiness. Home is where I'm in relation with people that there's this mutual uh, back and forth where I love them and they love me. That's, that, that's home. And, and so the reality is that you can actually live in a house with people and still not have a home. You can be filled with people and still not have a home. Because of the quality or lack of quality of the relationships where you're supposed to be accepted, but you've been experiencing rejection. You're supposed to be celebrated, but you've been experiencing abuse. You're supposed to, 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 to be a, a, a told that you have value and that you're worth, but instead, people are oftentimes told that there are nothing, that they want to amount to anything. And so the place, the house, that's supposed to provide a context for a home, oftentimes is a place that is void of the things that would make a healthy home. Because broken people oftentimes uh, end up hurting other people as well and causing more brokenness. And when you have a person who is living homeless, they're not the best source to tell you where to find a home. And so I submit to you, this idea from Luke chapter 15, the parable of the forgiving father, I call it. It's not the parable of the prodigal son. The point of Jesus telling the story is not to highlight the son, it's to highlight the father. The loving father, the forgiving father. And in this picture in Luke chapter 15, you see one son, the youngest son, says, Dad, give me my share of my inheritance. I want to I leave. So his father gives him his share of the inheritance. He goes off into a far country and does all kind of crazy stuff. He loses everything. He ends up in a pig pen. And he says, man, this is, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a bad spot. I need to go back to my father's house. And maybe I'll, I'll just ask him to hire me as a servant. Because even his servants are better off than I am. So he goes back home. The father receives him back fully in such a way that he did not anticipate. The father receives it back completely. But here's what I want you to see is that the son had a home. He chose to live homeless. He decided to leave his resources. 
he decided to leave his father's house and everything that his father provided. He had a home. That's where he could go back. He had a home, but because of his decisions, he felt like he would find out somewhere else something that he felt he did not have at home. Something that he didn't see was at home. So he said, I will go out here and do what I want to do, go where I want to go, say what I want to say. And he ended up finding out that that was not all it was cracked up to be. In our world, there are people who are spiritually homeless. But in our church, there are believers who live spiritually homeless. Have a home, but live as if they don't. Have a home, but live as if they don't have those resources. And I'm not talking about a church home. I'm talking about the Father's heart. You've heard this phrase, home is where the heart is. No, it's not just where the heart is. Home is where the Father's heart is. And so if you have not experienced the Father's love and in his heart for you, his love for you, you are going to live homeless. And just like that youngest son, you're going to try to pursue what you already have at home. Because you don't see it at home. You're not accessing it at home. Even the oldest son had the same problem. When the oldest son was mad that the youngest son came home, the father leaves the big party that he had for the youngest son. He goes out to the oldest son. And the oldest son says, you never threw a party for me. And the father says, son, everything I have is yours. The oldest son didn't know what he had at home. And, and the youngest son didn't know what he had at home. Both of them at the father's home and didn't know how to access the father and his resources, and what he wants to give, and what he wants to offer. And even though there are people out in the world who absolutely do not have a spiritual home, because they haven't found it in God the Father, we can't show them where home is. Yeah. We can't invite them where home is if we haven't found rest in that home ourselves first. When we demonstrate that we're living in God and God is living in us, when we demonstrate that we are home in him, when we demonstrate that, that there is joy in the presence of God, that there is peace, comfort, and security, that he really is all that we need, when we demonstrate that, then people will see that this is about relationship and not religion. But when we demonstrate that, oh, I, 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 this happened to me because I didn't pray, this happened to me because I didn't go to church, we're demonstrating religion. And so you might say, well, how do I know where I'm at? How do I know if I'm living homeless? I have a home. The Father has brought me into his family through Jesus Christ. I put my faith in Jesus Christ, that the blood of Jesus forgives me of my sins, and I, and I trust that for my salvation. I trust that the blood of Jesus puts me in right standing before God. That's what brings us into salvation. And, and, be, and, and the Father sends uh, his spirit, the spirit of God, to be him in us, to be Christ in us. So we have Christ living on the inside of us. We are inside of Christ. Like There is this spiritual reality and dynamic that, that, that can't be reversed. It can't be just because I have a bad day that doesn't undo the power of the cross. So I'm connected with him. How do I live from this place instead of still thinking that although I'm at my father's house, the, the good things I really want are out in a far country? Let me give you an example of what this looks like when we, when we do this. What real homelessness looks like, those who are unsaved, and then what living homeless looks like. When, when a person is sexually promiscuous, they sleep with everybody they can. We can look with judgment and say, man, they just, that's just crazy. They don't value themselves. They don't, no, listen, that's homelessness. That's homelessness. When someone is addicted to drugs or addicted to money, gambling, alcohol, whatever, don't judge them. That's homelessness. 
When someone has an anger problem, always mad at the drop of a hat, any little thing and just send them to the roof. That's homelessness. When someone is manipulative and controlling, trying to always get people to do what they want them to do, like they, they know what's best for people. You could be a parent trying to control your children. Like, it's like, listen, they're married now. They ain't your business. You're still trying to have your hands in that other, in that other house. That, that's, that's your homelessness. When we, when, when we are afraid, that's a sign of homelessness. When we're prideful, that's a sign of homelessness. We're trying to gain some things, affirmation, accolades, attention, to meet a need we have that from our brokenness because we didn't get healed from the Father. Every one of us has a level of brokenness within us because of life, because of the effects of sin, because of the effects of our decisions, and also because of the effects of other people's decisions. Maybe other people did things to us and we're still living with the effects of that. We have these things that have happened to us. We have wounds. We have brokenness that only the Father through Jesus and the power of the Spirit can heal. Only He can meet those needs. And if we don't go to God for the God needs we have, we'll put those expectations on people and expect people to fill the God need. And when we do that, we create destructive relationships. We create chaos wherever we go. And people don't want to be around us. Or if they do, it's because of their own brokenness too. We can end up taking the relationships that God has gifted to us for human flourishing and thriving. We can take those gifts and we can destroy them, putting a God expectation on human beings. Because we didn't find at home the healing, the truth, the power, the encouragement, the strength. And so even though we could have access to the Father's heart with everything that we really, really need. Everything that would fill and fulfill us. If we don't get it here, we try to squeeze out of people and we create hell for them. When we have access to the Father's heart. He is a source, it is a spiritual source that pours into us. He is the one that fills us. And when you live from fullness, you can give and not worry about taking. When you're walking around empty, you're trying to take from everywhere you can take. You become a, a relational liability to people instead of an asset. So there are issues that we have uh, um, in, in our personality, in our character, in our, our habits that show us where we're not depending on God, that show us where we have not let him speak to us. There are, there are those issues, it, it shows us the different, uh, the, 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 the topics that you've got these self help books for? You know why they're that thick? Because they're trying to teach you behavior from the outside in. That's why it's not going to work. You're going to need a whole lot of books. That's why you can buy all the books and still not be changed. You can buy all the books and you can be educated. Is that what you're looking for? I don't want to get smarter, I want to get changed. I don't want to be educated, I want to be transformed. And the Spirit of God provides for us transformation. So, so here's the thing. When you think about whatever your behavior issues are, right? Whatever the, you know, because there's a certain level of awareness we have of, the, of our stuff. Now, we, we know we got some stuff. And if you don't know, ask a friend or your spouse or your kids. <laughs> Better yet, ask an enemy, they'll tell you. <laughs> 
and help me with some self-awareness. <laughs> They've been waiting for that conversation. I guess. <clears throat> but so there are ways that we can see these things. The reason why this is important because this way it can help bring focus to our prayers. And we can bring something specific to the Father for Him to address and for Him to change. If we just come to God and say, God, just change me. I'm yours, just change me. Do what you want to do. That, 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 that general prayer, that might not get away what you're talking about. But if you say, Father, I, I've got this pride issue. Father, I've got this anger issue. Father, I'm still, I'm still jealous. Father, I'm still hurt. And, I, and I'm noticing in my behavior, people, I, I'm living in such a way that it doesn't honor you. I'm living in such a way that it doesn't, it doesn't glorify you. I'm living in such a way that this is not how Jesus looked and Jesus acted. I, need, I'm, I want to bring this to you because only you have the power to actually change me. So Jesus gives us the remedy. In John chapter 15, when he talks about being connected to him as the true vine, he says this word, abide in me. Abide in me. Don't, don't, just, don't just get saved and be like, okay, great, I got fire insurance, so I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven now. Now I can just do the things I want to do. No, 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 no. We, we don't become followers of Jesus and then separate from him as if he's not involved in the decisions we make every single day. His wisdom is necessary for the decisions we make every single day. I, I need him to tell me about my finances. I need him to tell me about my marriage, about my kids, about my future. About, I need him to, I can't separate, I can't just say, well, he's, when I die, I'm going to heaven, that's good. I, I, I've got that solidified now. And so now I'm trying to make it through life. No. Abide in me. Stay with me. Stay connected with me. And to, to stay connected means you got to stay aware. Stay aware of our connection. Stay aware of our relationship. Don't let the world distract you into thinking you can do this thing without me. If you look back on your life, there's a list of, of evidences of, how, of, of your decision-making processes. You have a long list of what happens when you make your own decisions. We fall into stuff that we, we could have avoided. How many times did you say, you know what, I should have asked God before I... Right? <laughs> and on the other hand, you're like, yeah, God told me. <laughs> I did ask him. <laughs> he did tell me. And I still... How many, how many times you had those my bad prayers, right? God, my bad. <laughs> just, I, I just, I, wow, I just really, because I really thought I could do better. And I didn't. And me making that choice reminded me that there's something still about home I haven't yet received. There's something about home I haven't received. When, when Jesus talks about re remaining with him, I want to read with you, read to you the, uh, this passage from the, the, the Passion Verse. It's not on the, on the slides. So I just want you to listen. John 15, this is what it says. So you must remain in life union with me. For I remain in life union with you. For as a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. I am the sprouting vine, and you're my branches. As you live in union with me as your source, fruitfulness will stream from within you. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. But if you live in life union with me, and if my words live powerfully within you, then you can ask whatever you desire and it will be done. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are my mature disciples who glorify my Father. Live in life union with me and I with you 
and fruitfulness will stream from within you. It will come out naturally. It'll be a flow. But he says, you got to stay with me. Abide with me. And here's why this is important. One of the things that characterizes homelessness is the whole idea of wandering. That people are wandering, trying to find home. When you see a person who is a dictator over a family or a dictator over a nation, they're wandering. They're trying to find home. They're not trying to find more power. They're trying to find home. They're trying to find what they think power will give them. Security. If I'm trying to get more and more and more and more, more money, it's not about me getting more and more money. It's about me getting what I think only more and more money will get me. Security. Security comes from home, not from money. When people do things, get more and more attention. It's an affirmation. Someone say, I love you. Right? Someone to clap. Someone to see you. So what you get from home. Ultimately, this is about identity. When people are wandering, it's because they're trying to find out there what they should have had at home. And even if your physical family, your biological family, didn't provide a home for you, the Father does. The Father, in your relationship with Jesus, the Father provides that home. And in that home, he speaks to you value and purpose and worth and dignity. And he speaks to you identity. Is why this is important. When a, a person wanders only because they at first wonder. Wondering leads to wandering. When you don't have answers to certain questions, you go to find them. I wonder, am I beautiful? I wonder, am I enough? I wonder, Am I valuable? I wonder, am I important? I wonder who I am. Let me go on a search to find it. Will I find value in, if I get the right position in my career? Will I find value if I get the right amount of power over people? Will I find value if I get the right amount of money or success? I, so they, they're trying to find where you get at home. What the Father provides at home. They can't find it out there, so there's just a never-ending pursuit. Never-ending satisfaction. Never-ending fulfillment, because it's not out there. They wander because they're wondering. So in the Father, the Father speaks to your identity. He gives you the answers that you were created to live by, so that you don't have to wonder. And when you don't wonder who you are, you won't wander trying to find who you are. So when the enemy tries to get you, tries to speak to you as the youngest son to get you to leave the father's house and to go to a distant country, he first has to get you to wonder. And if he gets you to wonder and he succeeds at you wondering, you're going to wonder. Let's look at these two situations side by side. First, in the Garden of Eden, we see Adam and Eve. Now, Adam is called the first Adam because he's the first Adam. Jesus was called the last Adam. There's a lot of similarities in their lives, and Jesus really undoes and does in a superior way what fell apart with the first Adam. Okay? So, in, so we see Adam in the Garden of Eden. We see Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by the devil when he first starts his ministry in Luke chapter 4 or also uh, Matthew chapter 4. But in the garden, this is what happens. The sat Satan comes to Eve, and, and there's a tree that they were told not to eat from. God told him, you can do anything you want to do, hang out in the garden, but do not eat from this one tree, the knowledge of good and evil. So they abided by that for, for, for some time. We don't know how long the Bible doesn't say, but here's, here's what happens. One day, the devil comes and he says to Eve, if you eat off of this tree, you'll be as wise as God, and God doesn't want that to happen. All right? Two-letter word, if. If. If creates wonder. Eve, if you eat off of this tree... You'll be as smart as God. Now, Adam is standing right there, too. He's like, girl, don't do it. Don't do it. 
But if you do, let me try something. <laughs> so, so, so Eve, Eve is considering. She begins to turn her back on everything God said, and now she's considering. Now she's wondering. If you eat off this tree, God, he'll, 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 you'll be as smart as God, and God doesn't want that. And so she goes, huh, I wonder. Then she eats, and then Adam eats, and then sin enters the world, and then there's a big mess. If you wonder, what is it happening? They get kicked out of the garden. What do they got to do? You get kicked out of the garden, the place where God put for you. You wander. Wondering led to wandering. In the New Testament, you see Jesus in the, in the wilderness. Now, he's the last Adam. He's got to fix what the first Adam messed up. He's in the wilderness, not a garden. He is fasting in a place where there is nothing. Instead of, uh, a contrast to Adam, he's in a garden with everything. And Satan comes to Jesus. And what does Satan do? Same trip. If you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And the difference is Jesus doesn't wonder. So he says, now see that's, there is no if. I am searching, watch this, because I'm home. I'm home. I and the Father are one, I'm home. Don't tempt the Lord your God, that's what the Bible says, it's, it's written. And so Jesus responds with the word. People always say, well, he, see, that's what you get. You got to respond with scripture. And authority is in scripture. It is. It's only in scripture if you're certain. <clears throat> you know, Christians try to, you know, want to rebuke the devil, right? Because we're told we're, we have authority. They all are in Jesus' name. And he's like, yeah, but you wonder if that really works. <laughs> right? You have no authority because you wonder if it really works. Hear me clearly when I say this. The power, listen to me y'all, the power is not just in the name of Jesus. It's in your trust in the name of Jesus. Some of y'all deal with deliverance and stuff. You can, you can yell Jesus' name all the and they'll yell Jesus' name back at you. Right? <laughs> Even in the ministry, what, what, what did the, the, the devil say? Jesus, we know who you are. Right? To, to Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, we know who you are. The Holy One. Have you come to torment us? They can say the name of Jesus. They don't trust the name of Jesus. Our authority comes in our confidence in the name of Jesus. Our trust in the name of Jesus. That comes when you're at home. You can speak to the devil when you're, when you're at home. He'll respond. Because your authority comes in your faith and your trust in that word, the name of Jesus. So the Father shows us an example in Jesus of what it means to not wonder. And when you don't wonder, you don't wander. And many of us are still wandering. In our relationships, we're acting like he is not our Father. Craig Rochelle wrote a book called The Christian Atheist. In that book, he's saying that even though we, we accept Jesus as our Savior, we still live as if God does not exist. We live as, as if he's not concerned about the temper tantrums that we throw. We live as if he's not concerned about all this. No, he wants to make us like Jesus. He wants to make us like his son. That's why he gave us his spirit. That's why he put himself in us and us in him. He wants to transform us to make us like his son. And he's not waiting up there just waiting for you to mess up so he can finger point at you and blame you. No, he, but he's wanting to conform us to the image of his son. Because his son perfectly reveals his nature as father. And when we do that in the world, people will see. People will see where home is. People will come out from the addictions and the drugs and, and pursuing material possessions and pursuing power and pursuing all these things that they think they're looking for. When people say look, someone's looking for love in all the wrong places, they're not just looking for love, they're looking for home. Look for home. There's homelessness. 
And we and we we don't have to live as if we're homeless. We can come home. And we say, okay, well, how do I how do I do that? The first thing is this: first, you have, the the thing that you chose to be to be saved, you chose to put your faith in Jesus. Okay, what most of us did not do was choose to make God our Father. We chose to put our faith in Jesus. I want to be saying, I even believe John 3, 16, God so let the world out. God, God's good as much as he, he gave Jesus. So we, we know he's there. There's a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But we don't really relate to him that way. To begin that journey is to begin by making a decision. I want to live with God as my Father. I want to live. I want to live with the person Jesus is bringing me into relationship with. I want to live with God as my Father. That's the first thing. Make that decision. The second thing, you, you want to learn how to, how to grow in your awareness. Your awareness of the presence of God. I think Aaron mentioned that earlier about the presence of God. Your awareness of the presence of God. Where you learn to live aware of the presence of God every single day. No matter where you are, whether you're in this building or not. The presence of God with your life has nothing to do with whether you come to this building or not. Right? He is with you. He is with you. And so you want to become aware of his presence with you and aware of the ways that he loves you throughout the day. He's expressing his love to you throughout the day. And oftentimes we don't, we don't see it, we don't recognize it. Or if we do, we go, oh man, that was, that was, that was cool, God. Like, he was looking out for me, he got my back. No, no, he doesn't just have your back. He's not just looking out for you. He's loving you. He didn't, he didn't bring a breakthrough just to give you relief. He did the breakthrough so he can show you about himself. He's loving you. He's loving you. He's loving you. And to see that about him helps you begin to accept that about him. So grow in your awareness of, of him. And as you study the word, as you study the word, don't study the word just to become smarter. Study the word to become closer. Study the word to know him more. Research is great, but research doesn't, doesn't make you like Jesus. Revelation does. When the Father reveals himself to you through, through his word and you see him, you see him, you, and you see what he wants to show you about himself in your life right now. He, he, will, he will reveal himself to you. When he reveals himself to you, that's the stuff relationships are made of. When people are dating, they go out to a date, they're, they're trying to, to, to learn who the other person is, and you want to reveal who you are, I mean, in theory. You know, that's the purpose of you getting to know them and them getting to know you. And so they're revealing themselves to you. You're revealing yourself to them. That's what God does as you study his word. Okay? And then also, in addition to, to making that decision, in addition to growing in your awareness of, of his presence and his love for you, in addition to, to studying his word, to learn about him, not just to memorize verses and scriptures, no, but to learn about him. In addition to that, you need to be in community with other believers. When you're in community with other believers, God reveals himself, himself to you even through them. That's what the body is for. How many times did you learn something about God by listening to someone else's testimony? You, you learn, you're like, man, that, man, God is amazing. Like, that wasn't even your, your particular breakthrough or your story. It was their story. But, but, but in community, you get, to be, you get to benefit. Although you live one story, you can live from many. And the benefits of many of God's stories with other people. So being in community is tremendously helpful. People who can help you be accountable to this identity as a child of God. People who can help you be accountable to seeing when the devil is trying to take you out and, and, and they, they, got, they cover your blind spots. They can help you see some stuff that you don't see on your, your, yourself. People who, who can help you be accountable saying, hey, you're, you're demonstrating some homelessness symptoms right now. You're, you're acting like God's not present. You're, you're acting like he hasn't provided a home. Well, let's, let's get back together. Let, let's pray right now. Let's get in alignment with his heart right now because the enemy has you distracted with some other things. Or maybe it's not the enemy. Maybe you just idolize some other things in this world. But whatever it is, it's gotten your eyes and your attention off of your relationship with God as Father. Let's get back to raising your awareness of the Father's presence in your life, his love in your life. Let's recalibrate your entire life on his love. I, don't we sing that song, I will build my life upon your love? Well, this is what it looks like. It's more than just lyrics on a song that you sing on Sunday. This Build your life. Not build the worship service. Build your life on his love. And it doesn't happen accidentally.
accidentally, it doesn't happen automatically. There are things you've got to do to position yourself, posture yourself, where you're building your life on his love. That's what's transformational. The love of God is transformational. That's what he wants to pour out on, upon you. That's what he wants to pour into you. And that's what he wants to pour through you out into the world. But first, we've got to deal with our own uh, uh, tendency to live as if we're homeless and come back home and say, Father, I choose you to father me. I choose you to lead me. I choose you to be the, my source of comfort and power and strength and encouragement. I choose you. And I'm no longer going to try to put these God expectations on other people. I want to be filled with you and by you so that when I'm in a relationship with, with others, I can pour out instead of trying to take. I can rest instead of trying to just receive. I can give out of fullness. And I can glorify you and I can be fruitful because your spirit will be producing this fruit through me. Didn't he say you, 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 your fruitlessness will come from within you? It will come from within you, like with ease. The, the fruit of the Spirit, He will produce that, that, that fruit in you. You don't have to try to be loving. You don't have to try to be joyful. You don't have to try to be peaceful. You can actually be loving, be joyful, be peaceful. He can make you that by His Spirit. Jesus Christ died for us to be completely transformed. <coughs> he didn't die so we can take acting lessons and act like we love our enemies. Act like we're patient and act like we're, you know, act like a good Christian. He didn't, he didn't die for that. He died so we could be just like him. The Father sent him so we could be just like him. He sent his spirit so we can be just like him. But the change happens at home. You will not find it in the world. It happens at home. It happens with him. It happens in his love where he makes us like his son, where he speaks to us. About our anger, our pride, our jealousy, our controlling tendencies, our fear, and the Spirit deals with it. He deals with it. He takes it. He changes it. He heals it. He does it. And when He changes you, you become something new. And when you become something new, you don't have to act like you're new. He wants you home. Don't live as if he hasn't provided a home. If you've been out in that far country, come home. Come home. Come home. There's a lot we can do in this atmosphere, in this environment. But you don't even need all of that. It happens in your spirit. Say, Father, I want to be home, and I want to live from home, and I want to invite others home. I want to show what it's like to be home, where there's joy and peace. And so when I smile, it's real. When I say I love you, it's real. When I say I forgive you, it's real. And when I say I'm sorry, it's real. And I want to be merciful. And I want to be kind. I want to do all those things. But I need you to do it in me. Because I sure cannot tame my flesh. My flesh just does not seem to be interested in living for you. Let's all stand. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to spend with your children, my brothers and sisters. Father, there is so much that you offer to us. Show us in our lives where we've been distracted, where we've been deceived, where we've been chasing other things, where we've been putting a demand on certain relationships because of our own brokenness and needs that you promised to fulfill. Show us how to take those expectations back. To free people up from us. Show us how to rely on you. Remind us of the things that you've done where you have proven yourself faithful. And we really can trust you. 
Help us decide to live with you as our father. Heal us from father wounds or wounds we have with other authority figures. Whatever it needs to happen, Father, help us to grow and live fully as your children where we are maturing in love and enjoying you and reflecting you through the rest of our human life until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.